welcome everyone to Unabridged Bookstore's virtual space. We are very, very excited tonight to have Emily Tedra with us. Um, Emily is the author of several novels, most recently, The Talented Miss Farwell, which has just been released in paperback. Um, she's also a great customer and neighbor to us here at Unabridged. So we're very, very excited to be celebrating this book with her. Um, Joining us for this conversation tonight, Rebecca needs almost no introduction at Unabridged Bookstore. She's such a big um, friend of the shop, and we're all such big fans of her book, especially The Great Believers, which has become a sort of perennial bestseller here at Unabridged Bookstore. Um, we're very, very grateful that you're joining us to have this talk with Emily tonight. Um, a few things before we officially get started. If you have not yet had a chance to read either of their books, that link that you were sent um, by email will take you to our webpage where you can find all the info that you need to get those books. If you have any questions for either of them as we go through our conversation tonight, um, the chat function is turned off, but at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A button. Go ahead and drop your questions in there. And as we have time um, after Rebecca and Emily have had a chance to talk. We'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Um, but thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting independent bookstores. Um, thank you for supporting these authors. And help me welcome Emily and Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. Hey, I think Rebecca. We, hey, hey. <laughs> it's, I think we might still, we'll, we'll talk, but we might. Uh, stall a little because I think there are a few I think there were more people in the waiting room than there are now yeah. in this room. So I, feel I like see only seven happened. that have gotten in. What do you yeah. see? Yeah. When um, and I think we knew that there were significantly more than that in the waiting room. So I feel like something well we can it's a very exclusive stall. party. <laughs> we can stall and chat. I just realized by the way that um since I last did book events, I've started working on my next novel, and you can tell that because of my I was wondering about like this. Stuff index card system, which I realize is not the greatest look to have like stuck around your head. I think it's fantastic. It'll put us right into that writer's mode, right? I That's wish what I could this read them, but I, yeah, that would not be fair to you. <laughs> might be a little embarrassing. <laughs> it's a lot of I don't know what happens here something happens here yes that's fantastic oh my god um so we'll start and I assume I think Matt is still around hopefully we can work on getting people in um or we can just make it look like the most exclusive party in town you got to wait outside that works the ropes, I'm the drinking basketball. champagne so that's good cheers um cheers thank you guys for being here Thank yeah. you to Matt, thank you to Unabridge, and thank you, Rebecca. I'm so glad you could sit and look at my face and talk about books. Yay, I'm really excited. Um, so this is wild because we did an event about a year ago, um, which was for the hardcover right. of this book, of The Talented Miss Farwell. And now it is a year later and we are still on Zoom. That's right, we still are. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and uh, yeah, pl please, um, we won't get to the Q&A for a while, but please start dropping questions in the Q&A. That's really great to see. Um, so here's the thing. This is your third book, right? Um, your third novel. Right. Um, and of course, you've published other things along the way too, but in terms of books, this is the third one. Um, this is, it, it, I think there's a great irony here in that this is by far your biggest book, um, I believe, in terms of readership, in terms of so. press, in terms of attention, in terms of copies and print. Um, and yet this is all happening, you know, minus like the book festivals and those events that would normally go along with that. So, I mean, we'll, we're going to talk about the book too, um, definitely, but I want to, um, I think people are going to be interested and I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, that sort of, I'm sure, double-edged sword, whatever you want to call yeah. it, of... Um, silver lining. <laughs> yeah, silver lining. Is it a, you know, do you think the book did better maybe even because people are, you know, locked in? Do you think that, I mean, is it just been, has it been a consolation in the midst of all this that you've had this great thing going Absolutely. on? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the whole... What I noticed right away um, doing book events, I think I started last summer doing book events for this book that published in September 2020 with the hardcover and then the paperback just coming out last week. What I noticed is that the book world pivoted 
smoothly and immediately to the virtual world of Zoom. And so I've done a lot of Zoom events and I have to like with bookstores, with libraries, with book clubs, and I have to say there's something really kind of excellent about them that you don't get at a reading, you know, in a in person. Um, they're more intimate. I think they're more um, subtle. I remember the conversations. I'm able to interact with people on a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. basis. Um, I feel like I can hear the questions more. I can take time to kind of think through my answers and respond. And, you know, sometimes when I stand up in front of a bookstore group, um, you know, it just, it's a little weird to be standing in front of a lot of people in person and my mind goes blank. So <laughs> I really like enjoyed the intimacy that the Zoom events bring. And of course, as a, as a reader myself, and I've been attending Zoom events this whole year, I think it's pretty awesome. You know, I put it on while I'm cooking dinner. I yeah. can listen in without having to get dressed up and go out. So, you know, and I think to your point about sales and stuff, like, you know, people need to read right now. And there's been reading yeah. throughout all of this. It's something we can do at home, but it's something we can do to feel connected. So I felt, I felt pretty good about books and reading, you know, during the pandemic. It has been a big consolation, I think. It's, it, this is the perfect kind of book too, to come out right now, like where it is both completely escapist and juicy mm -hmm. and really smart, you know, and that's a, it's a tricky area. Like I have a few writers in that area, like Jean Hanf Korolitz is another one where it's like the books. I loved all the plot. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. Right? Through that novel. Yeah. So fun. I got, just got to do an event with her for that too. Oh. It's like the perfect so time for a book like that. And like this one yes. is about like, it's the books, you know, I think of this category of books of like, what are, what is the really smart book I'd give to my really smart friend who's like laid up with a broken leg, you know, yeah. like doesn't want, you know, the, you know, doesn't want to go back and like reread Proust right now. Just want, like yeah, one. might not be really the time for like the magic mountain or it might not be the time for something right. super heavy and, you know, yeah. it might be the time for like a, a juicy scandal novel about a con artist and, yeah. you know, something that kind of takes us away from, you know, the horror show of the news headlines. Yeah. You know? But not all of those, you know, there, there are plenty of books that are in that territory of fun, juicy, whatever, that are not then they're not also giving you an intellectual workout and they're not trying to, I'm sure, you know, that's just like, you know, fun. This one is, you know, is both. It's, um, you know, we're, there's depth of character. There's really, really good writing. Um, there's a lot to think about. There are ethical things to think about. There's, we'll get to this in a minute, but there's like, you know, the comparisons to the real life story that inspired it. There's all this stuff to chew on, right? At the same time that it's, um, you know, like you're going to stay up flipping another page because you can't wait to see what happens. And this is really juicy. Yeah. So. You know, I've had some fun um, book club Zoom events where I basically, after I do my little spiel, you know, sit back and I would watch like these 10 or 15, like incredibly smart women, usually um, just like arguing about my character and you know, whether they love her or hate her or both. Yeah. And, you know, um, what did they think about what she did and how, you know, oh would you get away with it? And, you know, that was really fun. I just sort of sat oh. back and, you know, oh my actually God. there was one book club I did that was sort of full of psychologists. And that was fascinating because they were essentially like analyzing my character and offering all these DSM diagnoses Whoa. and, you know, arguing with themselves about it. And I was just like, I I just want to take it all in. It was really oh fun for God, me as a writer. Speaking of that, like this character and yeah. what's up with her, um, I think actually it would be useful if we talk first of all, just if anyone in the audience does not know the basics of the plot. Sure. Um, you want to give us kind of the Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a novel um, that is loosely based on a true story of a woman in a small town, Illinois. Um, uh, government who actually in real life ended up embezzling $50 million over 20 years. And it was a huge story regionally. A lot of Chicagoans are familiar with it. And um, I became sort of entranced by this idea that you could by yourself remain in your neighborhood and steal, you know, so much money over so much time. Um, the person in real life who committed the actual crime put it all into horse showing business. She was into horses. 
And um, when I got ready to like write my sort of fictionalized version of this story, I knew I couldn't write a horse novel. I'm definitely not Jane Smiley. I don't, I don't know about horses, but I'd had in the back of my mind um, a novel about the art world because I was kind of obsessed with um, not just like art history or looking at paintings or analyzing them, but the business of art and that, you know, I'm always like the first one to click on an article about, you know, the Damien Hirst shark that sells for whatever millions. And, and I, I just find all that stuff so like um, interesting and over the top. And I thought it would be the perfect place to set a novel about a con artist. So in my novel, Becky Farwell is both a small town government employee um, beloved in her tiny town, a single woman, and um, still living in the farmhouse in which she was raised. Um, while at the same time, she's sort of an art world, big name dealer, and she buys and sells contemporary art in the international market. And she manages to pull off this double life for many, many years. Um, and so that's kind of the, the general uh, through line of the novel. So yeah. And so the woman, um, and we can say her name, right? The woman. Yeah, oh yeah, Rita Crundwell is the the real woman's name. The real, yeah. And it's interesting because you did um, Farwell. Like, there's a little bit of a yeah, nod there. I but echoed it. I, Crundwell I is just such a name. Like, you know, it's just you know Crundwell. Yeah. I mean, it's really it really grabs you that name. Yeah. And Becky to me is is a nod to Becky Sharp from Vanity Fair, among other things. It totally was. It totally was directly from Vanity Fair. And I think yeah. I actually reached out to you. I was like, I know because her full name is Rebecca in my novel. <laughs> I remember texting you and being like, Personally, are you going to kill me if I write a novel that has like an anti-hero in it whose name is Rebecca? <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, oh, since I'm never, I've never been a Becky, so that, that helps a great deal yeah, not to think of us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's, so we were just talking back to, we think we have to share this. There's this update to yeah, big news. Quindwell's life, right? Yeah. So immediate, like four weeks ago, my phone starts blowing up with texts. People are letting me know that, um, the woman Rita Crunwell, who had been in federal prison, she was given a 20 year sentence, was surprise released about a month ago um, and has only served about half of her sentence. She was released into sort of like a, a halfway home or a place where she can be monitored, maybe home confinement. And it was a giant shock to all the legal experts, um, to the people who are invested in the case, to the small town um, called Dixon, Illinois, that she stole all this money from. Um, and to me, and uh, you know, it coincided kind of with the paperback publication, but I can't really claim it as a you know PR stunt that I myself set up. <laughs> but it is interesting, and of course, I'm curious to know what she might make of this novel that's yeah. sort of loosely inspired by her misdeeds. But it's been pretty wild, like to just think about um, you know that that this uh, this whole story arc of hers that I was so invested in has now taken this wild new turn, you know, kind of um, yeah. surprisingly. Yeah. What was your relationship? I mean, obviously you are renaming her, you rename the town. Yeah. Um, so you have a lot of leeway there, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, there's a lot, even when we aren't going for um, literal realism in terms of this happened, it's still a novel that reads very realistic. Um, that, you know, you you definitely did your research on the art world. Um, I think on the history of small towns uh, downstate. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Was, was that, you know, I mean, to what extent were you kind of beholden to the truth just in those areas rather than in... Right. Does that make sense? You know, like, yeah, I'm absolutely. I mean, I, you're right. So like, I did have this weird relationship to the truth because um, I really wanted to create my own character. And so Becky Farwell is not in any way connected to the real person whom I've never met, who I know nothing about. Um, neither is anybody in this book based on anybody real. Um, and I really like sort of specifically prevented myself from learning any truths about the facts of her life. Um, I just wanted to create my own character and had a very strong image of who she was, like her psychology, her, you know, her, her looks, etc. Yeah. But of course, I am not like an expert in um, small town 1980s accounting in, like, you know, <laughs> in, in the Midwest. And so I did turn to some people for some help with that. Um, you know, I was asking all sorts of weird, you know, I, I 
I was asking all sorts of weird questions like, well, what color were the phones? And like, what, you know, what, what was the air conditioning like? You know, I really like a sense of the sort of physical setting. Yeah. Um, and for the art world, man, like I have been a long time subscriber to Vanity Fair and they cover the art business pretty well. Like you could do worse than just like reading all the gossipy articles in Vanity Fair if you wanted a good sense of it. I didn't interview anyone. I just sort of lurked around. And then, you know, I lurked around on some like, I don't know, collector boards where people were talking just to get a sense of how these people think about money and art and what it means to own art. Because this is kind of at the heart of my character. I mean, Becky is obsessed with owning art like as a as a physical item. She almost has this visceral connection to it. Um, like she wants to eat it almost, you know? Um, and I just, uh, I had an idea about that, but I needed to know like a little bit more of the lingo. Yeah, yeah. What's been your feedback? I mean, from have, pe have you heard from people in the art world or people who know the art world since the book yeah. is coming out? Yeah, actually I, I randomly had a woman who used to work at um, Christie's reach out to me saying that um, she had read the book and one of her colleagues had read it and that they both um, were really, you know, really enjoyed it. Um, and I, you know, I've heard some other kind of like anecdotal feedback, so that made me feel good. Um, but I also know that, you know, I'm not, I'm not attempting to make it, you know, um, a verifiable, like, you know, fact. This is an educational type. tax. Yeah, this is, on. you know, if I needed something to happen, I made it up, man. That's like, yeah. you know, kind yeah. of what you do, so. What about, have you heard from anyone connected with Dixon, Illinois or people yes, who? I have actually. In fact, um, I've, I've been in touch with a couple people who, you know, had heard about the book before it came out. They were a little bit concerned originally, you know, they've been through a lot, the people of Dixon. Yes. And I, you know, I feel a lot of compassion for them. Um, again, even more so now that um, Crundwell has been released, you know, the, the internet, you know, the national media sort of descended on them and wrote all these articles about like, you know, how could they not have known, et cetera, et cetera. When in fact, you know, this kind of crime happens. I mean, this, the woman who actually pulled it off, Rita Crendwell, it's actually stands as an American record as of some sort, you know, like I think the largest municipal fraud in American history. Wow. So, but you know what? It happens everywhere, right? White collar crime. Um, yeah, yeah. But the people who reached out were, were really lovely about the book and um, said that it gave them some insights into like what, you know, maybe is going on in the mind of someone who can do this kind of thing. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. I mean, do you feel like you, you know, we all, obviously, we are all the characters that we write, even when they're doing things that we would never do. Mm -hmm. um, but do you, I mean, do you access a part of yourself as you do that? Do you access other people you've known? Yeah. Is it just a, sort of a dream like, I, you know, I, th I think I think people have different relationships to all of their characters. I mean, different writers will say like, oh, they just appear to me or no, they're all me or no, I like work this out on paper. Um, but I think that becomes especially um, complex and interesting when it is someone doing things that we would never do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully we would never do, but you know, <laughs> as far as we know, <laughs> it's a matter of degree, not kind, I think like, hmm. you know, one of, one of my sort of first, um, like, I don't know, intentions for this novel was, was to get at that kind of like panicky feeling that you have when you have done something wrong and you, and you're trying not to get found out or you're, you're, you know, hoping that you can put something by someone or that your mistake won't be found out, you know, your shitty email or whatever. And, and, and that sense that you just like the stress of it, the physical response you have. Um, I felt like, you know, I didn't care about people liking my main character. You know, of course we know there's such a gendered, you know, um, expectation of that if you write a female character or if you're a female uh, identified author. But, you know, I really wanted to have people like, even if, of course, we are not going to condone, you know, being a criminal or to this extent, that you could at least sort of feel with her as she feels panic, as she's trying to cover it up, as she's trying to maybe um, justify it to herself, that you could be interested, that you could be, you know, uh, surprised that you could be like 
of course, you know, we want her to pay for her crimes, but that I wanted to make readers sort of feel her heart beating as the, you know, the end game approaches and yeah. to have their heart beat a little faster too. Yeah, that's fantastic. Before, I'm going to ask you to read something to us in just a minute, but before we do that, as you're talking about, um, as I'll, I'll take you on my thought process. You're talking about the sense of you know, physicality. It's something I've always really admired in your writing. Um, even I have a memory of it's the most random thing, but from Blue Stars, your second novel, where this professor character is eating a salad, like a salmon salad, at like or frise something. And I was like, there was something about that. I was like, oh, it's like so physical. Like I feel I'm feeling this with her. I don't know how you Thank did it. You. It's a the randomest thing for me to remember. Um, but um, I was thinking about other examples of that in your writing, and and oddly enough, because so we are we are in a writing group together along with a few other women, and I saw really early um, examples of this. And it's funny because one of the very vivid things coming to mind for me is from your other point of view character. Who oh yeah, is no longer here. Kicked her out. Yeah, can you tell people, like, would you mind, like, kind of taking us through that? Like, sure. Yeah, happened? this novel came came out in a, a sort of an earlier draft with um, a frame narrative around it. So meaning like uh, a storyteller who's telling the story of Becky Farwell. And that character, you know, was sort of tangentially uh, connected to Becky, but younger mm -hmm. and going through her own sort of life story. And, and she sort of told us about Becky Farwell and um and you know I liked it but I was made aware by my um incredibly excellent editor that you know it was just sort of um softening what could have been a much sort of more direct and braver story and I just about Becky Farwell and I I realized that you know one of the reasons I brought that character in was because I think I was a little chicken to write you know a novel that had this woman sort of going balls to the wall and this big crime and these big plot moments and these big, you know, sort of stressful yeah. scandal scenes and, you know, that I had sort of kind of hedged my bets, right? Yeah. By, by creating that person telling, like I had removed myself one other, you know, sort of frame more. Yeah. And when I cut her, when I cut that whole storytelling framework, I think the story got a lot stronger because it just, uh, it, it didn't make any pretense to being anything other than it, what it was, which is the story about a con artist and her arc and her, you know, her beginning, middle and end. So, you know, that was a, that's maybe just like a little insight into kind of how a writer gets to the true story. Sometimes it takes, you know, some pretty painful revision and like, you know, some serious versioning um, until you get to your true story. It's funny because in the abstract, all of this makes total sense. And it's like, obviously that was the right choice, but all of us having read the whole thing and you get into it and you're like, but I love this other character. Yeah. You can't possibly cut this, the shower scene or the, what, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and then no, you, you get that remove. I'm looking at it, you know, a couple of years out from mm -hmm. or probably three or four years out from the last time we all saw it that way. And, yeah, of course, of course, this is what needed to happen. Yeah, yeah, um, that's why it's so good hard. to get to get a, a, a variety of um, of viewpoints on your draft. You know, you and I were just talking about that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah. you know, it's really helpful to have readers, um, you know, all over your life, you know, kind of get, able to give you some perspectives, you know. Yeah, yeah. Would you be willing to read to us? Sure. Story time? <laughs> sure, happy to. Um, I actually pulled a sort of a new section that I don't think I've read before. And it's um, a few pages from like the second, uh, second or third chapter of the book. And here we have Becky Farwell, who is about um, 18 or 19 and is not able to go to college because she is still at home taking care of her father, who is sort of losing his business and has had some strokes. So she's working at the town hall and she has just found an extra $500 that someone has made a mistake with and used it to buy the first ever painting that is gonna kick off the beginning of her crime. So I'll start there. Yeah. Okay. Her new evening routine that next month was to switch off the overhead and turn on her bedside lamp. 
you didn't need to look directly at a painting she found. In fact, sometimes it was better to move around in its proximity while pretending you had forgotten it was there. They weren't the same, but she remembered the same delicious charge she'd once gotten from slowly, so slowly, pulling her trig text out of her locker while Cal Hartman eyed her, turning a few pages, cocking a hip, replacing that book, stretching up to reach a notebook instead. Her back to him, her whole body covered in sparkly and visible ions from his gaze. Cal Hartman himself though, laughed. Tonight was Thanksgiving and Becky sat on the front of her bed in a turtleneck sweater and jean skirt filing her nails. Her insides felt thick and sodden from the three course banquet at the palace diner out on route four. With her father near silent the whole meal, there was little to do other than eat steadily from the thick white platters of food that covered their booth table. Turkey and gravy, potatoes and green beans and two kinds of stuffing. Three slices of pie, one extra because the waitress was fond of Hank and counting on that big holiday tip, which Becky had added to the bill. She filed and filed and waited for the painting to work its magic. The office was closed for the next few days and the streets were full of noisy students home for break, but Becky's room stayed the same, drafty, scuffed at the baseboards. For a moment, doubt flared, not at what she'd done, but why she'd done it. What if it wore off? Daddy, she yelled, not looking up from her nails. The late night TV movie was the second Indiana Jones and she could follow every chase or torture scene by the strangled sounds coming up through the floorboards. You asleep? To her surprise, the TV sound cut off and her father's heavy steps, same as always, even after the strokes, sounded up the back stairs. Becky met him in the hall. Come here for a second. She drew him in and gently settled him on the foot of the bed beside her. All they did was wrap it in brown paper, she mused out loud. Secured it with plain old scotch tape. I was expecting some big production like big box, thousands of those styrofoam peanuts, but no. The actual transaction had taken place in a back office at the gallery. The female clerk hadn't blinked when Becky produced her crinkled envelope of cash. Becky had had a whole story plotted out. My grandmother's 70th, we all chipped in but in the moment of truth, she forgot it all. I was so dumb, Becky said to her dad. She held it out to me and I didn't even take it at first. I thought maybe someone else was supposed to carry it to the car and like, tell me how to transport it or approve her setup at least. She'd stuffed a lot of pillows in the back seat, including the ones in cornflower print behind them on the bed right now. It won't bite, the woman had said with a dry single laugh, a little impatient. She'd had a cold sore at the corner of her mouth. I know, but Becky hadn't even been sure how to hold the thing, flat like a pizza, in front like a shield. In the end, she'd seized it any old way on fire just to get out of there. Here with her father though, she was the expert. She rested a hand on his curved back on the wool blazer she'd chosen for him tonight and urged him to appreciate how different it was to have a real painting in the house why it gave her regular old room a whole new feel and that he shouldn't worry about the money. She was doing real well at the office. Not everyone gets a bonus at the end of the year. She rubbed the slack muscles along his neck and shoulders. Storm. No, it's clear tonight, but he meant the painting. He was looking into the painting where the background slate blue with scrapes of white did lighten to a summer tornado shade of yellow green. That's a storm? Did he mean, had she spent 540 diverted dollars on a drawing of a gully washer? Maybe, Becky muttered, a bit sulky. The woman with the cold sore had insisted on rattling off facts about the artist's dates, influences, and methods while the painting stood propped on the office easel and Becky crushed the envelope of cash in her lap. I said it, take it, she wanted to say. Was this a kind of test? Why hadn't she learned anything about the artist before showing up here? And of course, it's the silo image itself, both archetypal and reminiscent of the farm in childhood where the artist, what is? The silo, the woman stopped in her presentation. The subject matter. Oh, right. So that was what you called it, that part. Becky supposed she had registered the shape of a silo in the painting. And now that it was mentioned, 
the forms of a sagging fence and a stand of cypress trees. But these images were somehow only tangentially related to the thing itself. Subject matter, she repeated silently. In all those fevered weeks of acquisition, she hadn't known what the painting was about. Holding her father's hands, Becky stepped backward to guide him down the hall, then waited outside the bathroom until the flush, then shuffled him to his turned down bed where she'd laid out his pajamas. He could take it from there, more or less. She made sure to put his glasses on top of the alarm clock, the one he used to set for 4.40 a.m., and plug in both nightlights. Back in her own room, she hurried into her own bed. What did it matter if her father didn't see what she did in the painting? That old lava lamp on his dresser, that's what made him smile. Hell, even when he'd been fully with it, he never cared about any kind of pictures, never remarked on one that she could remember. So why this queasy sadness? She wouldn't cry. She wouldn't give in to the sudden images pressing down on her. No college, no boyfriend, no mother downstairs wiping up the last of the kitchen after tonight's family feast. Becky rocked herself fiercely and marshaled a barrage of new thoughts like a deck of cards rainbowed out for her mental pleasure. There she is in the office, catching up the phone on its first half ring, turning in the week's report a full day early. Overhearing Mr. David say, that new girl's shaping up to be a real powerhouse. Now she's slicing through a tangle of invoices, back straight at her own metal desk, making Mrs. Harris's day with a pouch of shrimpy kibble for the tabby who lost part of his tail in a garage door mishap. Her neatly labeled record books, her own carton of yogurt in the break room fit fridge, the good mornings exchanged with everyone, even old Mayor Tomzik, if she happened to pass him in the lobby. Becky rolled onto her side so she could look at her painting. Hers, it was hers now, and who cared if anyone else recognized its power? Night winds started the cottonwood, cut the cottonwood branch, brushing, scraping. She clicked off the light. She lay in bed, urging the painting along. Go on, go on, change me. I'm gonna stop there. Oh my God. I'm so lost in that again. I like it's, you know, oh my God. Um, Thank you. That's fantastic. That was fun. I've never read that part out loud before. Really? That's a yeah. really good, it's a good reading section. Yeah. And then this thing happens, like if you, you do enough readings and you picked your sections early and then you're like. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's fun to pull something new, you know, a little yeah. risky, but fun. Yeah. I also like that that passage kind of um, gets at the cover of the book, like the, you know, the image of the torn paper. Yes. Um, I love my cover so much, you guys. I just have to, it's yeah. so fun. And um, as you can see, the designer did this amazing job, like making it look like a taped up brown paper. Yes. And, you know, the woman's, they got this, um, you know, image, I think that looks so mysterious and fun. And I just, yeah. I'm so into it. I love it. I'm so happy with cool. it. And they, I mean, the fact that they kept it for the paperback is yeah. always a nice sign. Like, yeah. It's become a recognizable book. Yeah. It's not a bad sign when they change it for the paperback, but it can be like, oh, we need to try this other market. And right. keeping it is really, it's, I mean, it's also just a great cover. I would yeah, thank you. It to be a change. Um, we have some great questions in the chat, so in the Q and A rather. Um, so, um, oh, can I first give a shout out? I see that my son is here. I, I saw that have to too. Say, Hi, Sam. I see his Good name Sam. there. He's <laughs> off at college now. So how nice of him to go spend some college time watching his mom on Zoom. All right, what, what are we gonna? Um, so I'm gonna combine a couple of these here. And um, someone was just asking in general about your research, but then someone else is asking, how you originally came across the real world events yes. that inspired the story. Um, I think you've you've somewhat answered some of those, but if you can, yeah. um, can you talk a little bit about when you, especially you know when you first heard um, the Rita Cornwall story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember it vividly. I was driving in Chicago. I was um, on Lakeshore Drive. I think I was carpooling my kids somewhere and. Um, listening to NPR, and they had this breaking news alert um, where the FBI had just arrested 
uh, Crundwell in Dixon, Illinois. And at that point, they had only, you know, known that she had stolen some millions. Um, they didn't, you know, until later find out that it was over $50 million um, from this tiny town and that she had done this, you know, by herself um, for over 20 years at, while living as a sort of a well-known, well-respected member of the town throughout the whole time. And um, I think partially because I, I grew up myself in a small town, you know, sort of in the New York City area, um, I was instantly interested, like, yeah, that is, you know, in a small town, people know everything and, and what a secret to keep and how did, you know, what did it feel like to pull that off? But the thing that grabbed me in the news report right away that day was that um, they made mention that the FBI had had sufficient evidence that she had committed this crime and they had sat on it, you know, while like wiretapping her for something like three to four weeks um, mm -hmm. and, and held off arresting her. And essentially the, the report said, you know, the reason was because they did not believe that a woman alone could pull off a crime of that magnitude. And they wow. were looking essentially for her male, like sort of co-conspirator or the leader of this, you know, ringleader, whatever. Wow. Um, and you know that that kind of fired my imagination too, and uh, it made me think about how we do have all these stories of Bernie Madoffs and you know, sort of like the male version of this kind of criminal mastermind. Um, but that here we had a woman, and and I was so interested. I just thought that I. I had to imagine what it was like for her to balance all that in mm -hmm. her mind, in her heart, um, and pull it off, um, and and what it would take to do that. And so I was hooked. I was totally hooked. Maybe maybe women do that way more frequently and just never get caught. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's something to be said about you know being underestimated, right? Mm -hmm. so no kidding. In the world no of crime. Kidding. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have, we have in the chat, um, in the, in the community, Sam says he's doing very well. So. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good to know, Sam. <laughs> um, we have someone else asking now that, um, the woman who inspired the story is free. If you could sit down with her, what would you tell us? What would you ask her about her life? Oh my gosh. This is a question I have wondered about. I have, so when, when she was um, incarcerated, I had had the idea that, it, you know, I assumed I'd have 10 more years of that, but um, I, had, I had thought about, you know, reaching out to her and, and seeing if she would accept a letter from me, um, introducing myself and, and just sort of telling her about this uh, book and, and seeing if she was interested, if I could send her a copy. And then if she wanted to communicate about it, I guess, you know, <sighs> I'm not sure what I would ask her. Part of me doesn't want to ask her anything because, yeah. you know, I don't really care that much about her, to be honest. I don't know anything about her. Um, and the in-depth sort of imagining I had done about what it would take to pull off that kind of crime is very much specifically about this character I imagined, right? This, you, you heard about her in my reading, like growing up with a, you know, a father who becomes ill and, and she's a she's an only child and then you know she lives in this farmhouse and then she's orphaned and the town sort of you know surrounds her and that's part of what gives her the cover to be able to do this kind of stealing and i have no idea if any of that is relatable to the real person and yeah. part of me wonders like what we would talk about and i also think it might be the most awkward experience of my entire life so okay. i don't know if anyone has any good ideas of what i should say, should this arise, yeah, right. um, let I'm me know. Talking. Um, I mean, you know, you're the character you created is fundamentally separate from this yes. person, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, no relation. No, I, you know, I know nothing about the real person, so I don't know. It would yeah. be a weird experience, but you know, of course, part I mean, of me is curious, but yeah. let me ask that a different way. If she yeah. wrote an autobiography memoir, Right. Published next year. Would you read it? I mean, I feel like I would have to. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I would have to, if only because everyone in my life would ask me about it. But, That's right. um, yeah. but yeah, it would be interesting. I mean, I have no idea if this is anywhere close to what someone experiences, you know, as a yeah. criminal mastermind. Um, but it would be, it would be interesting to know like what I got right or what, you know, what, what I maybe hadn't even thought about or imagined, you know? And at this point you're safe, you know, I think the, the worst time to read something like that would be like, you know, yeah. a month before your edits are due or yeah, something yeah, yeah. like throws you for a loop and you second right. guess yourself and you're like changing, you know, 
but the book is so it's done it's out there in the world you wouldn't have any temptation to Rebecca, do you want to mediate a panel if that happens you could mediate a panel between me and Rita Crundwell and we could like you know hash it out we have to sit in the middle <laughs> yeah I don't know I think we'd have to do it on zoom I don't know yeah I yeah oh my god <laughs> that would be amazing yeah. um so we have Rachel asking, um, you mentioned the sticky notes behind you, but oh. Rachel's wondering if you can talk about those notes in your writing process. Yes, I have to apologize. It's not exactly like the most, um, you know, photogenic background here, um, but I have started working on a new book and um, which I have already inflicted on Rebecca and my writers group, but I think part of my process is now visual. So this is, I'm in revision stage now. So this is me kind of mapping out the arcs of the book and making notes to myself about each chapter slash chapter that needs to be written. Yeah, um, yeah it's a, uh, it's, I, I am very visual like that. If I don't have this going on, I usually have like a giant piece of paper. Like when my kids were little, it was always helpful because they had those big pads, you know, you could yes. get those big Crayola pads and um, I used to spend a lot of time when they would color. I don't know if Sam remembers this, but like oh, yeah. Sam and Wendy would be drawing and I would just try to like sketch out visually the arc of my novel because I think it really helps me hold yeah. the whole story in my mind. Do you do any of that, Rebecca? Oh, do you I do, do any yeah, totally. like, you know, bulletin boarding or what do you do? I don't have a good wall, but I, um, I do love it. Is so neat compared to mine. Like, no, that's where the camera's pointed. Okay. <laughs> I'll take you on a tour later. Yeah. But, um, but um, the uh, I've done a lot of like note cards on the floor. Yes. Um, I do the big busher paper. You know. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll sometimes just like if I'm, um, you know, sometimes you're just in a conference room and there's like the big easel of paper and you're yeah, like, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, or like at a residency, sometimes they have that around. Yes. Um. But yeah, no, I totally, I draw out plot arcs, all that stuff. I do a lot of character maps. It's um, really hard to keep, I mean, and for the talented Miss Farwell, that was insane. I had, I mean, I had never written a book that takes place over the scope of 20 years before. And so that was like this immense amount of detail and I could not keep it straight without like big visual like timelines and, yes. and maps and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. No, and you change one little thing you right. know, in a 300 page you book move, like, and this one. And then all of a sudden you have to yeah. move like the next four and yeah, yeah easier I to do. I don't know if I've told you this story when I was working on my edits for the hundred for um, the great believers. And it was this like elaborate thing. Yes. I then had to pack up and go teach for a week in Denver, like right as the book was due. So I, I very carefully, like in order, packed up all my note cards and I brought them with me. And then I had them laid out all over like the floor of the room. And I came back from teaching and it was like, so I was staying in a bed and breakfast and I came back from teaching class one day and they were like, oh, we moved your room because this other people, these other people checked in. And so we moved all your stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh. I, um, I went up there and the maid had moved them, like put them back down in order on the floor in the exact same order. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. <laughs> How amazing. I know. I think mean, she felt I bad. Just, you know. I just realized that I think this is our version of like, um, in the, in those, uh, like detective TV series, you know, how like they're That's doing the map on the, with the, you know, like the crazy looking strings, like, yes. through it. I guess we yes. all sort of want that at heart, you know? Yeah. I also, I had a student once who, um, she like lived alone and, and I guess I owned her apartment. And so she painted a whole wall of the living room with chalkboard paint. Oh. And then she had her whole novel mapped out on this wall. Yeah, that's good. It was really cool. But then um, we, like this class, we were meeting again. And I was like, how's that going? She's like, when you bring a date home, it doesn't look like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it looks a little like that crazy wall when they're trying to catch the serial killer. Yes, or like <laughs> someone's been stalking you and you like suddenly walk into their house and you're like, why are there pictures of me everywhere? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we know how to, like, half the notes are like, kill George. Know. You know? Yeah, seriously, they're not, they look a little weird to the yeah. outsiders. Can you tell us at all what the new book is about, or are you keeping that close? Well, I can, 
describe it in general um, as something sort of fun and and a little different and maybe a little more um, a little more sex included, a little more romance, a little more love. Um, one of the things that I distinctly did in the talented Miss Farwell is kind of leave you know sort of relationships out of it. Becky is somebody who is just like a lone wolf, and that's really part of her character. She sort of has some attachments that she almost unwillingly, you know, mm -hmm. um, develops, but she's not about the domestic and she is not about like sort of love and sex and, and romance. Um, so I think I decided like, I'm just going to flip it and maybe double down on love and sex and romance. So yeah, I can say that I have read this book and it's, I mean, I'm asking totally disingenuous, like, what's it about? I know damn well what it's about. It's really, really good. Oh, so. you're, you're sweet. Thank you. How close, how far are you in this thing? Well, I mean, as you can tell, it's still a little bit on the wall, working on a revision, feeling good about it, but um, you know. Yeah. Who knows, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. Has this book been hard to move on from? Like, are you, you know, this is, like I said, it's it's been yeah. um, your biggest book. I don't know that it's the book you spent the most time on necessarily. Mm, I think it um, is. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you're still, um, you know, you're talking about this book in a, you know, in a way like a year later, there's still a lot of attention. Yeah. This is all really good. Is it, does that keep you in the world of the book? Um, or is it? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, so without giving away the ending, I will say that this novel has a definitive ending for this character. And, you know, I think my other books maybe did more of that sort of like, ambiguous fading away that yeah, we, yeah. we like to do a lot. And um, I say that with a smile because I love it, you know, and and you yeah. sort of get this ability as readers to sort of imagine but not know what the character's futures are. But in this novel, you you know, um, or you sort you know, you, you mostly know. And, and so I think in a way that's helped me to feel like it was a, a closed circle. Um, of course, I'm so lucky to still get to be talking about it and with the paperback coming out and with this crazy news about Crundwell being released, you know, that, that sort of puts me back in it again. Um, but I definitely feel like Becky's, you know, chapter closes at the end of this one. And that, that gives me a little bit of a sense of completion and, and separation. That is so interesting. It's like the difference between a song that like definitively ends and the one that just like I like the songs that definitively end. Forever. I like the songs that have like a big ending and yeah. um, big finish. That's a quote from um, Broadcast News. Do you know that? You know that movie? I know the movie. I don't remember the quote. That's funny. Holly Hunt and anyway, yeah. big finish moment. But um, mm. then the songs that fade out. I don't know. I feel like I like those ending endings. Yeah. Moments. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting what, what makes a definitive ending, you know, is it like um, this story can't possibly continue because every character in it is, has been blasted off into outer space right. or is it, you know, I think in some cases just like this story yeah. is so complete that we could, you know, follow this person later in their life but it wouldn't be about those same things anymore. Yes. Yes, I mean, it's true. I don't think anyone could really ask me if there's going to be a sequel to this one, which I get asked. Do you ever get that asked question? I get asked that for the great believers. Yeah. Which... <laughs> there's very few characters are, I mean, yeah. yeah don't, I, I don't, they don't give anything away because, I mean, obviously, oh. if somebody hasn't read the great believers, no. they need to run, no. walk. But... Thank you. Well, it's funny because this, I think the great believers contains its own sequel within it. Yeah. Um, it's about the 1980s and then you have this echo these woven in chapters of kind of you know you have some next generation type yeah stuff. yeah and it's like that's those are the only people who survived you're seeing them and you're seeing what happened to them what what would you what else would you do I can't even yeah yeah, yeah. so um Alice who is your agent and she is amazing um is asking if there was a particular scene that you particularly enjoyed writing or that kind of undid you um oh gosh yeah, there is a particular scene I loved writing. And um, it's one where it's sort of a minute by minute race that Becky has to undertake to deposit a check just before a bank holiday. And if she doesn't get to deposit this check, then 
you know, the whole thing will unravel. And so it's sort of a comedy of errors of her racing through traffic and getting a ticket and, you know, confronting all these obstacles. And they're mostly sort of like strange, mundane, everyday, small town obstacles. But the, the magnitude of what she's attempting to protect is so incredible that, you know, the stress on her, you know, is just insane. And, and, you know, I just tried to amp it as high as I could and to think about what it must be like to be, you know, holding that kind of pressure. Um, and I just had a blast writing it. I don't often get to write sort of action scenes. And this one was kind of an action scene for yeah. me. And, um, it was really, it was really fun. And I think, it, I think it turned out pretty well. So I do love that one in particular. It's cool. It's, it's yeah. When there's a ticking clock, when there's yeah. that, like, yeah. When you write literary fiction and not right. like, political thriller or whatever I know I'm never I don't think I'm gonna have like one with the nuclear countdown or the you know the bomb <laughs> under the bed I mean never say never but this yeah. was my version of that and and it was exciting to write I, I feel like I got a little like flushed while I was writing it yeah that's incredible yeah. it's a great I, I love scenes I love them partly as a reader but also I love them to show my students just yeah. examples of like extreme tension and how long you can hold it out yeah because I think people early in their writing, it's like, there's tension. Oh my God, I got to get rid of it. And right. then they like, <laughs> um, and also like, it's exciting. So it has to happen fast. Yeah. Shut it down. Shut it right. down. Shut it, like Very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Over and done. And it's like, no, no, no. You can go on for pages right. and pages. Readers so. love it. I love those scenes in novels yeah. and in, in fiction. So yeah, I should actually, I should find that scene and I should use it as an example for something I'm doing. Oh, so. that'd be cool. Yeah, there's another, there's a scene from Jennifer Egan's The Keep where the sky, have you read The Keep? Oh, that's like the one of hers that I haven't read. Do it's, I need to read it? It's book, it's her okay, best okay. book. It's so good. Did you know that Goon Squad is gonna get a sequel? Speaking of sequels? Yes, I did. I mean, it's, it's like, not, it's not a, you know, she's like, it's not a sequel, it's whatever, lateral, you know, whatever we in the literary world want to call something when we don't want it to sound like a sequel, but you know, great. it's a sequel. Um, anyway, what happens no, but the in the keep? Should I read it? You should read it. It is okay. also just like narratively weird, like the, yeah. the point of view is bizarre, but um, yeah. then there's this scene, I won't give much away, but a character is hanging out of a window by his feet, like by his toes and his shoe feet are slowly slipping out of his boots. And it goes on for like three pages, just like in his head, you know, like yeah. you don't get bored, it's riveting, but it's like that way that you can draw it out for oh, so long. Cause the scene, the scene you're talking about with Becky getting to the bank, like it, it takes a while, but it takes, it does, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I need to I need to use that for this thing I'm I'm teaching soon on. Okay. Yeah, feel free. That sounds good to me. Yay! Uh, if we have any last questions, this is the time to get them in. I see um, that Sam has gone off to do his homework. His rushing yeah. homework. What a good boy. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. Maybe this is also where I say thank you to people for showing up. This was so great, and thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Matt. This was really fun, and I'm I'm so glad everyone chose to spend there their beginning of September evening with yes. us talking about or this. some other date because this is going to be online and people can find it later That's so true. good point people too. Good point hi to you in the future yeah future people <laughs> if you can come back and tell us that it's all going to be okay that would be great yeah, that would be good <laughs> <laughs> um and hey, I think Matt again is rejoining us Oh, Matt, you're still right. muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I got so distracted. I, I was looking at the comment about going to do homework and thinking that that must be our cue, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm but I just wanted to pop in and say thank you to you both for joining us to do this conversation tonight. This has been lovely hearing from you both. Um, thank you to everybody else for joining us. Like they said, if you know of somebody else that'll be interested in hearing, this will be posted online later. So you're welcome to share that. And if you haven't gotten your copy yet, get the talented Miss Farwell. Yeah.